take a breath with me. The topic this morning is spirituality. And I'm having some emotion this morning. Because you may or may not be aware of what happened in our community on Monday. And what happened in our community on Monday was a misuse of spirituality manifested as a racially motivated attack on an African-American woman with her child present. Complete with racial slurs. She wasn't visibly pregnant. It doesn't change the fact that she is. So a pregnant African-American woman was attacked by a white male in one of our Grass Valley parks. <sighs> the human part of me wants to rage. <laughs> the human part of me, the southern, <laughs> the, the southern boy that was raised in the hood, <laughs> not in white south, but who was raised one of three white children in a black ghetto, just wants a name and an address. And I have to own that so that I can navigate that. Because if I don't take ownership of it, it will take ownership of me. And then I will engage in the very behavior that isn't okay. I am tired, I'm just tired. I am tired of the misuse of spirituality. I am tired of God and religion being used to hurt the manifestation of the very thing they claim to uphold. Because see, in true spirituality, there's only one. We are all made out of it, by it, to be it. On page 308, it's interesting, I'm doing this year long, reading the science of mind in one year. Yesterday's reading <laughs> starts with this. Spirituality is natural goodness. God is not a person. God is a presence personified in us. Spirituality is not a thing. It is the atmosphere of God's presence, goodness, truth, and beauty. If we f could forget that philosophy is profound, that religion is spiritual, and life is serious, all of which may be true, but if we could forget these things and approach reality, capital R, ultimate reality, as normally as we go about our daily lives, we would be better off. That calls me to see the divinity in the perpetrator. That calls me to step into my oneness with that man. That there is no separation between he and I. This morning I've been very aware of the words of my friend, my mentor, Reverend Deborah L. Johnson, who when asked at a prayer symposium, what about prayers that don't get answered? What about, you know, it, all the slaves that prayed and they never got freed? And she got quiet. And when she came out of the quietness, what she said was, and she happens to be an African-American woman, you might need to know that. <laughs> I am the answered prayer of my ancestors. Prayer is always answered. 
And where that has landed with me this morning is that those of us that have white skin have a spiritual duty to heal what our ancestors created. And here is what I know. If we do what is ours to do, and we do it well, and we do it with love, someday, somewhere, in the evolution of humanity, white people will be living and supporting a world that truly is free of racism. And when someone asks about the history, they too will say, I am the answered prayer of my ancestors. Because we get to become the ancestors praying for the healing. We are not bound by the BS of our ancestors. We are not bound by the hatred of our ancestors. We are not bound by this construct that dehumanized people simply because of the color of their skin and relegated them to an economic widget to use them to build the country that we enjoy. That is what is up for healing. That is the correct use of spirituality. We cannot erase it. But by God, we can heal it. I am tired when my wife calls me because she got pulled over for a minor traffic mistake. And my first thought is, please don't kill my wife because she happens to have brown skin. I want to be free of that thought. Now, most of that is my work to do. And nothing in our teaching says we put on blinders and pretend that what is happening in society isn't happening. The good news and the part I celebrate most, and you may find this odd, but this resurgence this resurgence of racism and supremacy tells me it gets that it's dying. It tells me that it gets that it's falling apart. And so it's reasserting itself, trying to regain its foothold. No. No is an affirmative command, folks. No is an affirmative belief. No more. And we have to go one step further. What instead? What instead? Because hate, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King taught us brilliantly, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only love can do that. When our houses were dark recently, Focusing on the darkness didn't change it. <laughs> didn't make it less dark. Railing against PG&E didn't make it less dark. Railing against those that participated, which is all of us, in climate change didn't make it less dark. What made it less dark was turning on a light of some form. And there were lots of different forms of light. We had candles. We had flashlights. We had little headlamps that we're all walking around with, looking like spelunkers. <laughs> Some of us found really creative ways to light up a whole room with a jar of water in your phone. <laughs> okay. The reason I bring that up, not every one of us is called to the same form of spirituality and action. We're not all called to the same form of spiritual justice. But something in you knows truth. 
The very essence that you were made out of knows truth and it knows exactly how to show up as that truth. Whether it is a letter to the editor, whether it is sitting silently in prayer vigil, whether it is having a conversation with other white-skinned people that may be challenging, that may hold a different view than you, whether it's going and sitting in a public park just to make it safe for people of color to show up and be there. There's lots of ways that we can step up. My call to you this morning is to go within. Find what is yours to do. And do it. Unapologetically. It's not to change how people think. It's to live how you think. Very different. Very different. Okay. I'll go back to the soup analogy. If you got a pot of soup, you can stand there and stare at that pot of soup all day long. You're never going to flavor it until you add something. All right? And when you add a spice, it's going to flavor the whole pot of soup. It's not going to stay right where you put it. That's how we change a world. That's how we change a culture. Flavor the consciousness with truth. Flavor the consciousness with truth. However it is that you are called to do that. I recognize that the way I am called to do it is way out of the ballpark for a lot of folks. Okay? I was born a social activist. Now, I, when, when you are born in the body of a little white girl and you know you're a little white boy and you're growing up in a black ghetto where the county jail, a whorehouse, and your house, you become a hub of intersectionality whether you want to or not. <laughs> <laughs> you, in order to live, social justice had to be my life. Because that's how I showed up. That doesn't mean that's how you showed up. So please hear, there is no expectation being placed on you about how you show up. There is a challenge to show up. The infinite is individualized as you. No one else, no one else is here to be you. No one else can bring your flavor to the soup except you. I'm not telling you what that is, but I am challenging you to bring it. To get off the sidelines and get in the pot. Get in the soup, because newsflash... You're in it anyway. Because <laughs> that's all there is. There is no outside of the soup. We are the soup. Today's reading, which continues from yesterday, talks about the biblical teaching and how the metaphysical understanding of that helps us understand how it's all God and sometimes we run amok <laughs> because we have choice. The story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden is a demonstration of how the creative process, how mind, law, and manifestation are misused. The example of the life of Christ is how it's appropriately used. We are at choice. It doesn't change our magnificence. Choice changes how we use it. It doesn't change whether or not we are it. And really, 
If y'all haven't figured out yet, I'm done talking about how we have it and how it's around us. It is time for us to stand unapologetically in the reality that we are it. We are it. No more soft pedaling. You are creation in form. Doesn't matter if you want to be. Doesn't matter if that makes you uncomfortable. Doesn't matter if little arguments pop up in your head. I can't be that. Because those arguments are just saying you're going to choose to ignore who you are. That's the choice we have, how we be who we are. But the one place we don't have a choice about is who we are. <laughs> because that which created us is manifest in the form of us. <laughs> and really, how freaking magnificent is that? We don't have to find ourselves. We don't have to go get power. It was born in you. You don't have to learn brilliance. You just have to use it. Because you are it. You don't have to learn how to love. You just, as Rumi said... Our job is never to create, to find or create more love, but simply to remove the barriers that we've created against it. We don't have to become anything. We have to stop being imposters. <laughs> Halloween's over. <laughs> Time to take the costume off and show up as you. All of you. Let's take this into prayer. What I know with absolute certainty in every fiber of my being is that there is one infinite, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent love. It is perfect peace. It is intelligence. It is abundance. It is life, light. It is everything that I have ever imagined and so much more. It is that field of infinite possibility. It is the mechanical surgical activity of law that receives its own imagination and acts upon it manifesting it in form of itself knowing this to be true <laughs> I feel everything light up in my physical being recognizing that I am that in form that all of the brilliance, all of the love, all of the infinite possibility of creation is right within my being, fully accessible simply by my attention, simply by holding in my awareness that which is true knowing that the activity of law acts upon it and brings that into form. The power within to heal everything unlike love already exists. And what is true of me, given the oneness of life, must be true of all. And so I speak my word, claiming, affirming, demanding a recognition within this perpetrator's awareness of the truth of who he is beyond the ignorance of hate is an inkling, is a movement, is an opening of the purity of the heart that lives within that man that knows the truth of his being. That within the victim, within the children, within the witnesses, is a 
claim on the truth of their being that they are not now nor have they ever been second class citizens or less than for any reason. That they are a glorious manifestation of the one exactly as they are. That each of us is called to serve, to live, to show up as the activity of clarity, of love, to be the peace that we want to live in, to be the inclusivity that we want to live in, to be the equanimity and the equity and the equality that we know is true in unity without any pull to the delusion of sameness. So grateful, so grateful to know with certainty that is anchored in the very being that travels within my physical body that this is truth and that truth known is truth demonstrated. Grateful to know. Grateful to be of use. Grateful to feel all that I feel. To know all that I know. And to step into that creative process of growth that moves me beyond what I knew I could be. Grateful, grateful, grateful. And so in this gratitude, knowing the completeness of the word spoken, I joyously let it go and with absolute expectancy eyes, heart, ears wide open to see the manifestation in form and experience. And I invite you to step into a greater knowing of you as we anchor this together by saying and so it is I love you and there are no words to tell you how amazing it is that I can stand up here and have this talk and know that I'm not going to be run out of the building. (laughs) 